Um, we want to greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're grateful to the Lord, to everyone that's here. And uh, we look forward to sharing with you the things that the Lord has laid on our hearts to share. <clears throat> Back in uh, December of 1991, uh, the year before I graduated from high school, still had a half of a year left. Uh, December 10th, I think it was, or December 11th, I was taken to Houston, Texas, uh, to what they call MEPS, uh, the military enlistment people. <laughs> and uh, that's where I joined the Navy, in Houston, Texas. And um, I most of you, you've heard me tell the story of my Navy career, and basically how it didn't go well. I joined the Navy, and in August I, of 92, I went to basic training, August 11th, 1992. And, um, Graduated from basic training, uh, I think in October or November, and um, went to Operation Specialist A School in Virginia, Virginia Beach, after I left uh, there and uh, graduated. <coughs> I think I was the third person in my entire class as far as um, graduation and grades, I guess you could say. So it seemed like everything was going well. Um, midway through that school, uh, my mother's father died, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, and um, they did not want to let me go because to his funeral because he was not an immediate father, I guess you could say. He was not in my immediate family. And so went before a board to argue the case that um, he had something to do with raising me and one of my instructors was there with me and he, he basically pitched a fit on my behalf and they said oh, they approved it, but by the time they approved it, my plane had already left, and I had paid around, I think, around $600 for the ticket, and it was non-refundable. So at the end of A school, um, we pick our orders of where we wanted to go, and you get to pick them based on where you are in the class. And uh, so I was third in the class, in the entire class, and so I was the third to pick my orders. And um, I picked where I wanted to go. I, I picked California. And uh, everybody, <laughs> uh, you know, it was a lot of people wanted those orders, but I purposely graduated <laughs> as, as high as I could uh, so that I could pick the orders that I wanted. And so, you know, uh, I got my plane ticket. Uh, when I went the next day to get my plane ticket, because that's how the Navy did it at the time, I don't know if they still do it that way, we usually didn't have to come out of pocket to buy our own plane ticket. We could just go to the office and tell them where our orders were, you know, and they'd see it in their system or whatever, and they'd purchase our plane ticket for us. So I went to pick up my plane ticket, and usually in the Navy, when uh, in the military, when you have to go from one place to the other, they give you money up front, a check, to move, and I was supposed to get around $3,200 to go from Virginia to San Diego. That, at that time, those were the moving costs. And I'm thinking I'm gonna get all of this, except I didn't. When I went to pick up my plane ticket, they gave me a plane ticket uh, to go to, to fly up to Dover Air Force Base. 
uh, still on the East Coast. And they gave me $178 to drive there. And I said, well, what is this? Why? Who? What's going on? Well, your, your ship is in Mogadishu, Somalia. So, no, we're not giving you the 3200 you thought you were going to get to drive to California. We did, or have your vehicle move to California and you fly there and get it there. You, your ship is in Mogadishu, Somalia. I, I said, so why didn't y'all tell me that yesterday when I picked my orders? Well, we didn't know at the time. So I bite that bullet. I go drop my car off down in Georgia at my Uncle Toy's house, and I fly up to Dover Air Force Base. I get on that plane. It was the, um, I think it was around the 20, 6th of March, and when I got off the plane, it was the 29th of March, and uh, we didn't land anywhere. They, it was one of those big jumbo planes. At that time, it was the biggest plane in the world, and they had other, another plane. Whenever it was time to fuel, it would just be another plane come fly and sit on top of us and fuel us that way. That's where my fear of flying left. I was in the plane for so long, I didn't care if we went down or not. I just, I just want to get touch some ground, you know. And so uh, <laughs> we we had to we landed in uh, Egypt, in New Cairo, West Egypt, and because the plane was having problems. And uh, so we left there and went on into Mogadishu, Somalia. We landed there. And when I got there, a lieutenant colonel who was in the uh, Marines, he was the, at that time, I think he was over the base where we were. And we met him. He said, oh, you guys, y'all come in to catch your ship. I said, yes, sir. He said, it looked like that's y'all ship sitting out there. In the morning, y'all go get some rest. And in the morning, y'all, uh, we'll take y'all by helicopter out to you, fly y'all out to y'all ship. Yes, sir. So we woke up the next morning, went to sleep. We woke up the next morning. And when I woke up, I was in a tent, and it was a, a Somalian lady in my tent cleaning it. Uh, this is some stuff here. I'm just, this is a whole nother life. I ain't used to all of that. Just seeing some strange woman, you know, just, it, I guess that's the way they do things. So we went, ate breakfast, and we, uh, and then we went to, uh, to the lieutenant colonel again, and I said, where's the ship at? Well, it was out there last night, uh, this morning at 3 o'clock when we got here. Oh, no, that wasn't, it ended up that wasn't y'all ship. And so upon him telling us this, he had three Marines, it was three of us, uh, that had graduated together in that A school that were going to the same ship. And uh, he had three Marines come to us, and pull out, I guess they were M60s. This is how you take them apart. This is how you put them together. Every morning when you wake up here, you have to have a password. Every day the password change, and if you don't know the password when you're asked, within a few seconds they can shoot and kill you because they can deem you a spy or somebody that's just trying to get in some kind of way. My immediate question was, well, how long do we have to put up with this foolishness? Well, we don't know. You know, it's, we're in a war area, and we don't know when the next plane is coming in, so y'all basically need to buckle down. So I was there, and every night they had a, uh, uh, a um, jet fly in, uh, like a, it was uh, what they call a steam jet, and its purpose was to bring supplies. And every night, and our camp was right by the runway of these jets. And every night I slept with my fingers in my ears because if you can imagine a jet that runs off of water, steam is what pushes it. And it was very, 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 very loud. To this day, it's the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. The loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. And uh, 
Every morning we get up, they tell us the password, and we spend half the day saying it in our minds what the password is. Okay, this is the password. And then they bring us a little a bag. Say, here's your here's your food. This is wrapped up in a you know them as MREs, meal ready to eat. Well, we didn't know anything about that. We're not in the army. We're supposed to be eating some real food. What is this? And so, you know, they had, I think, 32 different meals, and you were lucky if you got the one with the ham in it because everything else was suspect. The idea, the idea behind meal ready to eat is basic MREs is what they call them, is you could boil them. Just put the whole bag in the pot and just boil it, and that's what would heat it up. You know, it was basically like canned food, if you can imagine. Just no flavor, no, no nothing. Just salt and pepper was a, something to fight over, I guess. And so that next month, they came and said, okay, we found out where your ship is. It's in Bahrain. Okay, so how are we going to get there? Well, y'all got to wait on a plane to get here. Well, when is that coming? We don't know. We'll know when it lands. Okay. So at some point it comes. We get on the plane and we go back through Egypt. And, but, but before we land, the plane, one of the engines catch on fire, and we're all smoked out up in the cabinet. And this was one of the planes, it was the biggest plane that they make. On the bottom, it's got tanks. If you can imagine how big tanks are. You know, it was probably about the size of this place here, as far as width goes. That's how big that plane was. And it, it had tanks sitting on the bottom of it, and we had to walk up these steps, up this ladder, to get to where we would sit at. And one of the, <coughs> one of the engines catch on fire. <coughs> and it only has two engines. But we can't land because we're flying over enemy territory. We have to get to Egypt, to New Cairo, West Egypt. So we get there and we're just sitting around, and I asked them, so when are y'all flying another plane in here? They said, no, we're trying to. Well, we're going to fix this one. Uh, no, well, y'all might fix it, but we're not getting back on that. Except you are. So we got on the plane, and we went on over to Spain. The Air Force Base, Torrejon, Spain. And waiting on another plane to come through. We were there for about a week in Torrejon on that base. That was an Air Force base. And uh, we got tired. We couldn't leave the base because we were not Air Force and we didn't have the ID to get back on it. So we had to stay on base and we had to shop at that little bitty commissary. Well, that, they didn't have regular groceries. They had canned food. And for about two weeks there, I, all I ate, I kid you not, was chili beans and ice cream. That's all we all ate. Now, if you can imagine what that bathroom must have smelled like. <laughs> I thought, you know, of course I was still young, you know, uh, still 18. I thought in my mind, you know, I can eat this for the rest of my life. Until after about the third day. <laughs> Canned chili beans and ice cream. That's all. So then they told us, well, you know, there's a Navy base down in Madrid. We're going to ship y'all there. We're going to take y'all there. So we got in a cab, and they took us to that Navy base. And we were there for two weeks doing some detail work, painting and stuff like that. Now, we didn't go to school for all of that. But, you know, they told us, if you're on this base, you're going to work. Come on, get on up. You're going to paint. So that's what we did for two weeks, paint and cleaned. But wait a minute, we're operation specialists. We're supposed to be doing some high-tech stuff. We, didn't, we don't know nothing about all of this. We didn't sign up for this. I don't care. 
You in the Navy now, boy. You going to do some painting. So two weeks, that's what we did. And then they, the Lord sent somebody to tell us they had a plane ready for us to go to <laughs> Bahrain, finally. So we get on a plane. We fly through Naples, Italy. We land there, and then we get on another plane from Naples going to Bahrain. We land in Bahrain. Um, of course, you know the story. I was sitting at the airport with my legs crossed, one leg on top of the other, and it was a big uproar. And then somebody else who just happened to be in the military uh, he'd come and tell me that uh, that's, that's a bad gesture, having your feet suspended and pointed at some man's wife. To, to them, it's like giving them the middle finger. And so they whisked us out of there before anything could jump off and took us on to our plane, to our ship. Got to the ship. And they, it was a big birthday party. My commanding officer on that ship, his name was Nathaniel Beeson. He's still alive today. And even back then, he looked like an old man. I, I found him a couple of weeks ago, still alive in California. And uh, that day, it was his birthday. And then they threw him a big party. And I guess their tradition was he was supposed to take a picture with the, he was the oldest person on the ship, and he was supposed to take a picture with the youngest person. And guess who the youngest person was? Me. I was still 18. I just turned 18. So he and I took a picture together, and I thought, okay, well, okay, so I guess, you know, it's going, getting up in life, you know. It's better than the whole Mogadishu thing and all of that. You know, I got to take a picture with the captain, the commanding officer. He was a good man, uh, but he retired soon after that. And then came somebody on the ship who, you, you, you just have to know the military. You got two type of people. You got one person, uh, if they're in, in, high up in rank, they don't care. They just, you know, to them, the military is just a job. And I'm not going to step anybody, you step on anybody, you know, doing my job. And then you got the type of individual that's trying to make rank. And they're the type of person, they're going to volunteer their whole command to do stuff, to go out and paint yellow lines in the street to make rank. Everybody understand what I'm saying? They don't care about your personal life, you see. They, they care about themselves making rank. And what it does is it, it brings bad morale among people. So this other commanding officer, he come on, and that's kind of where he was. He had something to prove. And so it just went downhill from there. And at some point, I just honestly, I just took on a bad attitude. And my mindset was, if, I don't care what your rank is. If you can't whoop me, don't tell me what to do. And so it got to the point where, you know, that commanding officer or some of his, the people right under him, they'd come through and they see people higher rank than me doing things. And I'm just sitting off to the side. And they say, well, why bowling ain't working? Well, we don't know. Because bowling don't want to be here. You know, y'all done got on my nerves with all of this foolishness. So it was just a lot of things going on. It's just a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> when we got back to San Diego, finally, I was given leave, two weeks leave. Uh, no, actually, I was given a month leave. And, but when I, got, when I got back on the ship, they said, well, you, you know, we're going to have to arrest you because... You, we had only gave you two weeks leave. I said, no, I was given a month leave. Well, that's not what we got on our records. And I had to find the paperwork to show them that they had actually gave me a month leave. Because every year, you get 30 days in the Navy. That's what it's in the military. That's what you start off with. Every year, you get a month. You earn a month of leave. And so that was a mess. Went to captain's mass and showed my paperwork. Captain's mass was like court on a ship and uh, showed my paperwork and they, they say, well, yeah, we see right here. Well, you, you did have a month leave. And so it embarrassed my superior because he called his captain's mass and that's when the higher up superior people have to be standing there. It's a court, it's what it is, but it's on the ship. And he was embarrassed. So from that point on, he set out to 
to make my life miserable. And uh, so I went through some things with that. Uh, um, like I told you before, my, that my brother was getting married and they refused leave for that. And then my, I found out my stepdaddy, they had given him so many months to live and they refused to give me leave for that. So it was just all kind of things and my superior to my face told me that he was going to mess me over. He said, I'm going to mess you over. But he didn't say it like that. He, you know, folks, in, they cuss like sailors there. And that's what he told me. I'm going to mess you over. And so I thought, well, you know what? We're about to decommission this ship. I, we're, you're not going to see me anymore after that. You know, I'm about to go to another, another uh, uh, command. And, you, you know, you're not going to have anything to do with that. Except he did. When I got to my next command and it was time for me to get paid, all of a sudden, all of my, my financial records were not there. I found out he had sent them to a whole other state somewhere, like to another base, as if I was going to that base. So for a whole year, I didn't get paid. In the Navy, in the military, you know, you, of course, you just, it's just like anything else. You get bills, you, you have bills to pay and all of that. In, but in the military, uh, and they're more than happy to extend you credit and all of that, knowing you're in the military, because in the military, if you get behind on your bills or something happens like that, uh, they're not calling you anymore. They're calling your commanding officer. You know, and so I was getting, my command was getting these calls, uh, you know. And so then I, I had to get another job. I had to do my job on, on the base, and then I had to work, you know, for free on the base, and then I had to work another job to be able to pay my bills. So it was just, you know, all kind of things, and I can go on and on. I can stand here for hours and hours telling you about all of the different mishaps that went on. Up here, this, this folder here, this is my military record. This is my all of the places I went to and captain's mass and the court martial and all of that, it's all in this file here. And the conclusion of my service, what they call a certificate of release or discharge from active duty. At the bottom of it, it says signature of member being separated. And under that, it says dis discharge and absentia which means, like, like what I told you before, when they court-martialed me, I was not there, I was AWOL. They knew where I was, you see, but I was AWOL. And, and they did that on purpose. They normally would just wait to bring you back so that you could tell your side of the story, but they didn't do that. They discharged me, they gave me that bad conduct, conduct discharge in absentia. In other words, I was absent. And uh, so it says the character of service, bad conduct, narrative reason for separation, court martial conviction. So now that's, that's on my record forever. And um, so a few months ago, uh, somebody felt led to purchase a rifle for me. And so when I went to get the rifle, uh, at first, you know, you know the story. At first they said, you know, okay, your, your background check comes back fine. And then when I went to pay the, for the background check, by the time I got to the back of the store again, they said, oh, no, we can't release it to you. Here's a number you need to call to see what's going on here. So I called the people and they said, oh, yeah, look like you got a court martial conviction. And we need to see your, what they call this, what I just read you, the DD-214 your discharge papers. Because if basically if you're if you are convicted of a felon felony, then we can't give you a rifle. We can't allow you to have it. You know, if you have a, a dishonorable discharge in other words. I said, well I didn't I don't I didn't get a dishonorable discharge. So I had to send that in to them. And once I got that cleared then they they went on ahead and released it, you know. <clears throat> but I'm thinking all of these years later almost 30 years later, and this follows me.
All of, I could go on and on and on about all of the things I went through when I was in the military. When I was in the military, I, I didn't live a Christian life. I was living for myself. I hadn't gave my life to the Lord. I spent, the, you know, the last few months that I was in the military, I spent in the brig, which is their term for prison. I was being told what to eat, when to eat, all of that, just like, it, just like any other prison. I look back on all of that, those bad experiences. Now, I want to make it clear, the Navy wasn't the problem. My disobedience to the Lord was the problem. The Lord told me to start preaching when I was 12, and I refused. And then when I turned 17, I was talking, it was a lady, Miss Evelyn Johnson. I, me and my brother, we used to cut her yard and do things for her and her husband. They were kind of elderly. And I was sitting in her living room, uh, waiting to get paid, and just talking with her, me and my brother, and talking with her and her husband. And uh, she, she had told me, we heard you join the Navy. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, you might not like it. She said, my son didn't like it. She said, he did four years and he got out. He absolutely hated it. I said, well, I'm going to like it. And again, the Lord was reaching out, trying to reel me back in. Don't do it. This is going to be the biggest mistake of your life, one of the biggest. And then when I graduated high school, my uncle, Uncle Dudley, he was my, he's my mother's oldest brother. He pulled me to the side. He said, John, don't go in the military. He said, go to college. He said, I'll pay for your college. I said, well, Uncle Dudley, I've already joined. He said, well, it's not too late. You haven't raised your right hand a second time. If, if you just say the word, I'll get you out of that, and you can go into college. I said, no, sir, I'm going to just go on in the Navy. Again, the Lord was trying to pull me out. I found out just a few years ago, after my uncle had died, why he was doing that. I, you know, I, I, maybe at that time I, I knew he had the money to put me in college. But at the time I didn't know if it was something serious. He, now he wasn't joking when he said it. But uh, I was told that when my daddy was on his deathbed in the hospital, the last thing he told him was, I'm going to take care of your children. Don't worry about your four children. I'm going to make sure that they, they, don't, they don't have a need. And in his mind, that was him fulfilling his promise. I'm going to put your boys through college. I'm going to do that for them. But I refused. And I went on ahead in the military anyway. And looking back on my life, I can see how one bad decision, because I, I want to share something with you. I ran into all kind of individuals. I was one way before I went in the military, and then after I got there, I became a whole different other way. I saw people who were slicker than me and felt like I need to be slicker than them. I saw women running game on men. I saw women, uh, women would invite you to their house, and you thinking that it's just something casual. And then you look, you know, you, you look on the, on, the liver, on the coffee table and there's a picture of her and her husband, but he's overseas somewhere. And what it did, it, it just made me very hardened even t towards women in California. I thought, hey, y'all are some dogs. It, it, you can't afford to fall in love out here because the, these women are just, you know, that, that was my thinking. Uh, you know, my first night in California, my first night there, I was going, 
I went into a fast food restaurant. And it was a young lady standing there with her boyfriend or husband or whoever he was. It was clear that he was really, really jealous. She turned around and looked at me, and he said something to her to get on her about it. Oh, you know, it ain't got nothing to be nothing in here. I don't know this, y'all. It ain't got to be nothing in here. And you know, folks in California are crazy. They're just as, uh, you know. And uh, when you're out there, you feel like you have to be just as crazy to survive. You have to let folks know, I don't, you know, I don't play either, you know, that type of thing. On the way back to my vehicle, this, this girl and her boyfriend, they're walking to their vehicle, and I'm walking to mine, and she drops a napkin. She sees that she drops it. And I don't think anything of it, but, you know, I thought, well, let me pick this up, you know. It's not usable now, but I'll pick it up and get out of the parking lot. And I pick it up, and it has her phone number on it. First night in California. That was the rest of my time in California. Everybody understand? That was the rest of my time. I ran it. I, I became a certain way that I'm not proud of. All because I refused what Miss Johnson was trying to tell me, and I refused what my Uncle Dudley was trying to do for me. So for four years, I spent in this environment becoming just as rugged and, and rough as what I felt like I needed to be to, to survive. One decision. I'm going to do what I want to do. There's this thing, some of you, and we've talked about, talked about it before, the butterfly effect. And I, I, it is a real thing, and here's the definition. It is the sensitive dependence on initial conditions in which a small change in one state of a deterministic, nonlinear system can result in large differences in a later state. Does everybody understand what that's saying there? You can make one small decision here, but it can affect you and it, it can blow up down there. Everybody understand? They, they call it the butterfly effect for this reason because the idea is a butterfly can be flying in China flapping his wings, and of course, if you fan something, you, you creating wind, and the idea is across the road, across the world, there's a tsunami, or there's a hurricane, or there's a tornado, because a butterfly on the other side of the world flapped his wings. That's why they call it the butterfly effect. God call it sowing and reaping. <laughs> rejecting wisdom. And you may say, well, Brother Bowden showed me that in the Bible. Go read the story of David. He looked up on a woman and lusted after her, and this woman was already married. That's where it started with him. And up on, and thousands of years later, even down to Jesus Christ, the sword never left his house just like God said. If he got the sentence today, they still being killed. Everybody understand? Just, I mean, it didn't take long for, it to, for him to see the results of his, for, of his actions. His sons turned on him, children sleeping with one another. One son killed another, and then that son was killed. It, it never left his house. His own son that was born in Bathsheba, the first son, he died. It, the sword never left his house. Why? One decision. I'm going to look on this woman and lust after her. And from there, after that, after he lusted, he called for her, slept with her, 
got her pregnant, and when he found out she was pregnant, he, I got to hide it. So I'm going to call, I'm going to work in deception, I'm going to call her husband off the battlefield and get him to go sleep with his wife so he'll think the baby is his. But the man was so honorable, he said, well, I'm not going to do that as long as I have soldiers on the battlefield. So he, so he slept at the doorstep of David, and so David concocted this king, well, now I got to have you killed. So he called in one of his commanders and told him, well, put him in the heat of the battle so he don't fall by our sword. That's what he did. Except God's got eyes. If we're going to get anywhere in God, we better go back to that butterfly. Everybody understand? We better go back to that butterfly if we can look at our life and see how messed up it has been. And I don't, I don't care how good you thought you were. Before you came to God, you were junky. Somewhere in our life, the Lord was trying to get our attention. Even before we were living for him, he was trying to get our attention. Don't get this way. Don't you do that. And people, people like the heat under themselves. Everybody understand? <laughs> Let me just, let's just bring it down to our level. There are people in this room who somewhere in their past, somewhere in their past, and it's more than one, two, or three of us, there are people in this room somewhere in their past had a venereal disease. You didn't get that by obeying God's word. Everybody understand? Oh, you didn't, you, you, no, ain't none of us got that by obeying God's word. <laughs> Does everybody understand? And we can look back and say, well, you know, this person was just raggedy. No, you were raggedy. And even if you managed to avoid that devil, you still took on some more. You got a spiritual disease. Everybody understand? <laughs> People, listen, if you are not living for God, the whole world that's not living for God, all they're doing is committing a slow suicide. They are just self-inflicting themselves. That's all that's what it, what it all boils down to. And so in the Navy, I was meeting all these people. I had, I mean, I could tell you crazy, 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 very crazy experiences there. But I, I'll share with you this butterfly effect. I was in the Navy when I met my first wife, my ex-wife. Now, you know the story behind that. And I don't say that to make her look bad or to run her down or anything like that. Just things didn't work out, you know. But I want to share something with you concerning something like that. When you're out of God's will and out of God's way, that means you're in another way. In that other way, everything that's happening is going to be bad. Everything. If you were living in the day of Jesus Christ and had, as, as, as a woman and had run into him and you were out of the way, you would have been trying to marry him. And here's what I'm saying. You could have married Jesus Christ and it still wouldn't have been God's will and it still would have went bad. So when I, everybody understand. So you can't have the mindset of, oh, but this was a, uh, you know, this was a bad person. No, the situation was bad. It's not the person that's bad. The situation was. You pay attention to the folks you have yoked up with when you were outside of God's will. When you didn't know God, the devil is the one stacking those giants. Everybody understand? And they all had to be killed. Nations had to be obliterated. 
They, the children of Israel couldn't move into the promised land or, or alongside their enemies. They had to kill their enemies. We have to learn to see our past for what it is. We were making some bad, bad decisions. And you've heard me say it before, when we're outside of God, especially when we got a little pride mixed with that, God will flip that stupid switch. And you can count on it. Every decision you make, I don't care how good you think it is in the moment, it's going to end bad. And you may say, well, Brother Bolton, you got four children out of your first marriage. Yeah, and God could have gave me those same four children with who I'm with now. Everybody understand? <laughs> you know, my wife and I, back in 94, we were in New Orleans at the same time. Same time. Brother Tanks and I and, and his wife, we were only back in 94. How old were you, Brother Tanks? Three? How old were you, Sister Tanks? Four. And I lived about 30 miles from them. <laughs> Everybody understand? But when you're hard-headed, you're going to miss all kind of stuff. You're going to miss all kind of stuff. And then 20, 30 years later, the Lord's got to bring it all back around. See, this is what would have been had you been in my will. You see that now, the butterfly effect? You can be living right next door to somebody that you're supposed to help in the Lord. But you won't, if your mind ain't there, it ain't going to happen. So I met all kind of people, picked up all kind of heartache and things like that. Basically went through more than what I needed to go through behind my decisions. My decisions. And listen, it ain't just about me. Other people suffered because of my decisions. I was out there deceiving and being deceived, like the word says. I was out there hurting people and people were hurting me. I wasn't better than them and they weren't better than me. We were just all out there living for self. But I'm going to tell you, there's a fix for that. You know, I did not have to be living for the Lord to be making better decisions than what I made. When my uncle came to me and told me, John, don't, don't go in the military. I'll, I'll pay for your college. If you go to college, you're a smart fellow. If you go to college, I'll pay for it. He didn't come to me speaking in tongues about it. But that was the Lord that sent him to do that. And oftentimes, if we don't hear, thus said the Lord, then we think it ain't, that is not, thus said the Lord. No, I don't feel like I have to speak in the king's English, in old English. I'm talking to you young people today. And I mean, when I say young, I mean younger than me. And that's just, that's everybody in here except my wife. Y'all are young. You're at a point in your life where every decision you make is going to be critical. Don't get in flesh and make decisions that will follow you the rest of your life on the wrong side of the road. Everybody understand? One decision, it, it could follow you for the rest of your life, just like it followed me all the way to Jackson, Tennessee in Academy Sports when I was trying to purchase a rifle. That decision I made in my living room or in my room, bedroom, when I was talking to my uncle, and in Mrs. Johnson's house, when I was talking to her, that decision followed me all the way to Jackson, Tennessee. 
Bad decisions follow you. And God is not saying you got to get saved to make all good decisions. But listen, follow wisdom. Everybody understand? Let's go to the 15th chapter of the book of Proverbs. You know, I, I told you, Miss Johnson, she's deceased now. I wish I could have went back to her and talked to her about it. I don't remember if I ever did. But I tell you what, I'm sure she saw my name in the newspaper because when you go AWOL, the Navy puts in, they, they find where home, what your hometown you're from, and they put your name in the paper. I bet she read that. And she probably thought within herself, I told that boy. You know why? Because she told me to my face. You think you know everything. Can't nobody tell you anything. Now my thought wasn't, well, you know, maybe she's right. My thought was, well, I'm, I'm still going. And I, don't, I can't believe you even said that to me. You don't, lady, I'm just here cutting your grass. You don't, we ain't got that kind of relationship. I tell you, God sends wisdom through flesh and blood. Everybody understand? He sends it through flesh and blood. And don't make the mistake of having something in your heart towards some anybody, because that's exactly who he's going to send it through. That's why it's important. That just live your life not carrying anything in your heart towards anybody so you can avoid that downfall. God will send you the person that you don't like. Everybody understand? <laughs> Everybody there? The 15th chapter of the book of Proverbs? Let's start reading at verse 3. It says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Everybody see that? Now, listen, whenever we're talking about God, let's always keep this in our mind, that he don't live in time. When I was sitting in Miss Johnson's living room, and he was speaking through her, he had Jackson, Tennessee in his mind. He had my first marriage in his mind. Everybody understand? It, it was present to him right then. He didn't have to get some binoculars and look down the road. He don't live in time. So all, the, all of the things I went through, me putting my fingers in my ears, he had that in his mind. That's why I'm sending you two witnesses not to go in. I got all of this stuff in my mind. You see that? So verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Everybody see that? A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Now let's look at verse 5 carefully. A fool despiseth his heart, his father's, what? Instruction. Now, this whole book of Proverbs, with the exception of chapter 31, was written by Solomon, and I think it might be another chapter, was written by Solomon to his son. Wisdom came through flesh and blood. Solomon's sons, which he had plenty of them, they couldn't say, well, I'm going to go in my prayer closet and see what God has to say to me. You, this is your prayer closet now. I'm talking. What does that say? A fool despiseth his father's instruction. Everybody see that? But he that rega regardeth reproof is what? Prudent. Everybody understand? In other words, they're watchful and wise. They're going to be paying attention to stuff. But the ones that despise it, they're going to fall into stuff all the time. God is, is obligated to flip that stupid switch. 
I, I've seen it my whole life. I had the stupid switch. It's still there. But when I surrendered to the Lord, he flipped it off. But I can tell you this. If I had ever been sitting in Brother Junior's living room and he told me something and I rejected, he'd have flipped it back on. That stupid switch don't go anywhere. Everybody understand? No, it don't go anywhere. It's programmed in us. A fool despiseth. So you see what a fool does. A fool despiseth his father's instructions. But he that regarded reproof is what? Verse 9, let's read that. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after what? Righteousness. Everybody see that? The wicked have a way. When I joined the military, I was on my wicked way. In other words, my wicked path. There was nothing good that was going to come on that path. Does everybody understand? Nothing good comes on that road. And the Bible says that when the wicked is on that way, that they're an abomination to him. But look at what the last of that says. But he loveth him that followeth after what? Righteousness. That's on the road of righteousness. <laughs> now isn't that something? It says that the wicked, the way of the wicked is an abomination to him. But he loveth him that's on the road of righteousness. So what does that say about the wicked that's on the, on the wrong way? Does everybody understand? Let's go and keep reading. Verse 10, correction is grievous unto him that, hath, that forsaketh the way. Does everybody see that? Correction is grievous. It's a grief to them. I'm gonna, let me make this clear. We're not going to go to heaven not liking being corrected. That you're not going to heaven if you have an issue with correction. There's not going to be one bastard child in heaven. Does everybody understand what I mean when I say that? If you don't, go read. I think it's in the book of Hebrews. Sons receive correction. Bastards hate correction. They're going to still receive. They're going to still hear it, but they hate it. It's grievous to them. And we as believers, we have to get in our minds when God sends somebody to us to correct us, it's not an attack. Now, in our hearts, if we consider it an attack, what does that mean? We already have our, our reputation already intact. In other words, we already think we're in a place where we're not. We feel like if God sends somebody to correct us and we don't accept it, what we're telling God is, I'm already good. And if God, now let me make this clear, if God is correcting you, he's telling you, you're not good enough to spend an eternity with me yet. That's the reason for the correction. Everybody understand? You're on the wrong path. So, refusing correction is the same as somebody putting in their GPS where they want to go. Heaven is the Heaven is the destination. But then you turn off the road somewhere, and then the GPS is trying to tell you, no, this is the way of the heathen. Don't go down that road. This is heathen road. But in your mind, you say, well, you know what? It's got to be another turn off somewhere down. I'll get myself back on track. But the GPS is telling you, turn around. Make a U-turn. No, no, I'm going to just keep going. You're going to get to heaven? You gonna on, by that GPS going down Heathen Road? Going down Wicked Road? 
Then now, now here's the thing: the longer you stay on that road, the more stuff you're gonna run into. Now the deception is this: the longer you stay on that road, the more hardened you become. The more determined you become. It's got to be another turnoff down here somewhere. It ain't just one way to heaven. Except it is the highway of holiness. So it says, correction is grievous unto him that do what? Forsaketh the way. So everybody understand, God, just by the first part of that verse, God sends correction when somebody have forsook the way. That's what the correction is. Other than that, there would be no correction. If you didn't forsake the way, God wouldn't have to correct you. Everybody see? So it says, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. You know why it's grievous? Because they don't think they forsook the way. I'm still on my way to heaven. God is saying, no, you're not either. There's no way. That, why you think I'm? Nobody can reject instruction from God and still go to heaven. It's not going to be one hard-headed, stubborn individual in heaven. We're going to have to be meek and lowly. Everybody understand? We're going to have to be humble. Look at that last part of that verse. Let's read the thing. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall do what? That's talking about the second death. You ain't got to hate reproof to die your first death. But if you hate reproof, you're going to die that second one. Everybody understand? You, we have to get to the point and first realize this. Lord, when I came to you, I was in a junky state. And I need to be detoxed. Now, and we don't get to tell God what condition we're in. He's the one grading the papers. Everybody understand? And if he sends somebody to us to let us know we've forsaken the way, we better accept that. Because it's downhill from there. The stupid switch will be flipped when we reject it. Solomon is speaking from experience. His stupid switch was flipped. His daddy told him. God told him what the Mosaic law was. Don't stay away from foreign women. They're going to turn your hearts away from me. Uh, I'm grown. You know how many grown folks in hell? We better not ever get grown. Everybody understand? We better not ever get too grown to accept wisdom. Solomon, married, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Most of them were foreign women. And you know what they did? They did not leave their gods to go follow Jehovah. Solomon's heart went after those strange women, and he started bringing in altars and building temples for them, for their gods. And because of that, God said, I have to have a remnant for myself now. So he split the kingdom of Israel into two. So when we read about the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, that's the reason why it was split, because of what Solomon had done. Everybody see that? Let's go ahead and read verse 11 now. Hell and destruction are before who? The Lord. Everybody understand that? What they're saying there? This is the reason why we preach the way we preach. Because just like it's before the Lord, it's before me all times. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. Everybody understand what he's saying? God is not just living in heaven and hoping that you get there. 
Hell and destruction is before him as well. And so he preaches like it. I'm not just telling you to go to heaven. I'm, telling, I'm also telling you to avoid hell. Why? Because it's always present. And so God in his mercy, when he see one of his little ones, they veered off the road a little bit, he sent somebody to pat them back on. David wrote in the Psalms, the 23rd number of Psalms, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know what the staff was? How many of you seen a sheep heard a picture of it with the, that long staff with a hook on the top of it? You know what that was for? It was to, if the sheep got out of the way or got out of line, they take that long staff and put it around that sheep's neck and pull him back in line. That represents God's word. Now, how many of you know what a shepherd did if a sheep kept getting out of line? How many of you seen a picture of a man with a shepherd around, a, a sheep around his neck? You know why he's carrying the sheep? Because he had to break his legs. If you have a sheep that get out of line, other sheep will follow that, that one that's out of line. They don't know any better. And so what the shepherd have to do, if, it, if he see it's got a problem sheep that you just going to keep misleading sheep, I'm going to break your legs. I'm going to carry you, but you're going to learn. You're going to be hopping from here on out, but you're going to learn to stay in line. So oftentimes, most of us, we've seen the picture of the man supposed to be the Lord with the sheep around his neck, and we think, oh, look at how graceful and merciful the Lord is. He's carrying this poor little sheep. Why is he carrying them? Because I, this is one hard head. I had to break their legs. Yeah, it's grace and mercy, but not like you think. Everybody understand? <laughs> the grace and mercy was me breaking their legs. Now, I'm not doing it because I'm just so close to this sheep and just he's just got favor. <laughs> verse 12. Uh, verse 11. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Everybody see that? God, the Bible says that the heart is wicked above all. Who can know it? We can really deceive ourselves with our own hearts. You mix that with pride and you got a dangerous individual. We all like to think we're somewhere. But according to God's word, how do we know we're the sons and daughters of God when God can correct us without us getting an attitude about it? Verse 12, a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Everybody understand? Pay attention to your friends. If they are just as silly as you are, then you might be a scorner. Scorners don't like reproof. They hate people that reprove them. And the Bible says, neither will they go unto the wise. In other words, it's not, it's not in them to go to somebody that's more mature or older than them. They don't like that company. That's a scornful person, a person that don't want wisdom. I don't want to be told, I'm just glad I'm grown. I don't want to be told what to do and how to live. I want to get out here and get all these venereal diseases that I can. I'll learn by that. I'll get out here and get my heart broken, all kind of bad decisions and relationships. I, I'll learn by that. Is that God's will? No, we ain't got to, you know, my uncle, he was in the army. He was trying to keep me from what he knew. I should have learned by his experience. I could have asked him, well, Uncle Dudley, why, what is it? So why is it you don't want me going in the military? You know, my uncle was in the Korean War. How many of you have heard of the Agent Orange? 
Go look it up. That's what he had. That's what he died with. Years and years and years, decades later. Agent Orange. That's what he's trying to keep you from. Bitterness. No, I didn't get the same Agent Orange, but it's it, just the same. Spiritually damaged. I didn't even have a mind at that time to ask him. I wish sometimes, and listen, you don't have to get my age to, 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 to do this. I wish myself right now could go back in time and ask questions. But you know what this Bible says? Neither will he go into the wise. Why, Uncle Dudley? I didn't, see, I didn't know anything about him having Agent, Agent Orange. I didn't know anything about all of the, his ordeals in the military and what he had went through. But he was trying to keep me from that. If I, my heart would have been in the right place at the time, I'd have thought, you know what? My uncle loved me. If he loved me enough to put me through college, then maybe I ought to just consider what he's saying. I didn't even consider it. Because I already knew my, I had my way. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's what it all boiled down to. You know, <laughs> when the Lord was giving me this message at 3 o'clock this morning, and he was telling me, you know, what he wanted me to say, I was like, well, Lord, let me see that in the Bible. Show me one of your servants in the Word that just was hard-headed, and they just didn't want to want to follow what somebody was trying to do, you. <laughs> You're enough. Let's go down to verse 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. Everybody see that? But the mouth of fools feedeth on what? Foolishness. You know what that's saying? So they don't, like what we just read, they don't go to the wise. But if they've been corrected and they hate reproof, they're going to call somebody. They're going to get into the company of somebody that's got their stupid switch flipped as well. And they're going to feed on it. That's what that's talking about. Everybody understand? Don't act like that ain't what we did, did. And what we still do at times. When we hear something we don't like, we're going to go find somebody to stroke our ego. Or we're going to call, hey, what kind of person you think? I mean, what has been your experience with me? Like, what kind of person you think I am? You're not calling your enemy. You, you talking to somebody that you've done stuff for. Well, I don't see nothing wrong with you. You're good. You've always been good to me. That's what I thought. I thought I was a good person. I know I'm not crazy. <laughs> Stupid switch. And people that's got it flipped, they're going to call somebody else with the same stupid switch that's flipped. Everybody understand? We better get around some folks that's wiser than us. Let's go down to verse 21. Folly or foolishness is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. Everybody see that? Everybody understand? But a man of understanding walketh how? Uprightly. Verse 22. Without counsel. Purposes are what? Disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Everybody see that? You can have your mind set to do something, but without a counselor, you're going to be disappointed. Somebody that already did what you're trying to do. <laughs> but if you that individual, 
you got to go out and get venereal diseases before you figure out you, that sleeping around ain't, ain't it. The devil got a whole slew of them. Read that again. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. What's established? Purposes. You can get what you're supposed to get and do what you're supposed to do when you're around folks that have already been that through that and they can give you some kind of counsel about it. Verse 24. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Everybody see that? Verse 25, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. What is that saying? How, why, why, what does verse 24 have to do with verse 25? In verse 24, the Lord is saying that the person that's looking towards the things of God, it's above his own way, and, but he's going to stay on that path and he's going to get to that way. And he's going to depart from hell beneath. But the opposite of that is this. Then you got individuals, they don't care about the way of God. Their way is more important. And what it is, at the root of that is pride. My way, I'm going to get to heaven my way. And without any help, without any counseling, without any reproof. And the Lord said, I'll destroy that house because that's pride. Let's go down to verse 31. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among who? The wise. He that refuses, refuseth instruction despiseth what? His own soul. But he that heareth reproof getteth what? Understanding. Let's go to chapter 16 now. Start reading at verse 2. All the ways of a man are what? clean in his own eyes. Everybody see that? We all okay in our own eyes. But the Lord weigheth what? The spirits. Does everybody understand what that's saying? <laughs> How many of you remember that demonstration I, I told you about that the Lord himself had come, Brother Junior was sitting at his dinner table uh, reading his Bible and the Lord walked in and sat across the table from him. Brother Junior had a glass sitting on his a glass of water sitting on his table and the Lord put dirt in that water and he let that dirt settle to the bottom. When all that dirt settled above that little dirt at the bottom it, the water looked clean. And Brother Junior said he looked at the Lord and the Lord said this is how people are in my church. From here on up, they look clean. He said, but if you want to find out what's there, and he said the Lord stuck his finger in it and stirred it up, he said, just stir them up. You'll find out what's there. You saw all that dirt that's settled at the bottom, it'll all come up and it'll look muddy. How many of you have ever watched TV Joshua videos? How many of you notice? the pattern that he uses. When he comes across somebody that he knows is demon possessed, he get combative with them. He get in their face. He speaks louder and with authority. That's to stir that spirit up. Okay, spirit, now that you've manifested, now we can cast you out. Because everybody's nice and pure in their own eyes if ain't nobody made them mad. If ain't nobody got under their skin, that devil will hide right at the bottom of that glass. Would you bring the word, that rod, and stir him up? The Lord sent me over here to talk to you. The Lord told me if you don't do this and this and this, you're not going to do it. It's, gonna all, it's all churning. And they hoping you get out of there before it all comes up. Okay, so devil, now that we see you, we can cast you out. One of the biggest problems in church is people are hiding 
are trying to hide. But we just read the eyes of the Lord are all throughout the earth. They, they everywhere. And it's all before him. Even in my Christian walk, if I did something that was contrary, I had to say, Lord, that junk was on the inside of me. Clean it out. I told you what all happened between my ex-wife and I and what all, all that story. How many of you remember that story? I had to confess after that. Lord, it's some stuff in me. Everybody understand? It's still something there that ain't right. Clean that out of me. And the Lord in his mercy, you know, we can't walk around not wanting to get stirred up. Because a clean water, a glass of water, you can stir it and stir it, ain't nothing going to come up. It's still going to be water. Don't make the mistake of trying to avoid God's finger. If I, just, if I just put myself around people that's going to appreciate me and celebrate me. <laughs> no. Get around some folks that get under your skin until you ain't got skin to get under. That's what's going to clean you all up. Everybody understand? We're going to expose all this mess. <laughs> we make the mistake. We, we only want to be around friends. Ain't nobody stirring up anybody. You know how I am. I know how you are. I know what, I know what buttons you got. Now you know what buttons I got. And we're going to get along because we've learned each other. And both of you going to hell. Behind buttons not being pushed. If you got buttons to push, they need to be pushed. We need to see what all you can do. I see anger there. Oh, I see lying there. Okay, let me press these other buttons. You got all kind of buttons. Everybody understand? And to me, that we don't graduate from that. That's something that we, we stay in. Lord, what is it that's in me that's not like you? And then even when we've got rid of some buttons, that don't mean they can't come back. So verse 2 says, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Let's go down to verse 17. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Everybody see that? So you see how we keep talking about this way here. Let's go down to verse 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. In other words, what is that saying? You can really think you're on a right path. You can really think you're sold out to God, and it seems right to you. But the Lord says it's, it's the way of death. In other words, you can be that deceived. You can think you're on the right road, and you're not. That's why we have to be humble. Verse 18, pride goeth before destruction and a hearted spirit before a fall. Why does pride go before destruction? Because if God sends somebody to try to correct you and pride is there and you don't receive it, what choice does he have but to allow you to be destroyed? I'm going to tell you this. We have to be willing to accept this fact that somebody sees what we don't. Everybody understand? How many of you ever had something in your nose but you didn't know it was there? But somebody loved you enough to tap you and say, hey, you got a friend. Now up until that point, you thought you were it. I got on my fly, I'm popping my collar. 
Got on my Stacy Adams with a big green booger in your nose. <laughs> you matching though, because you're super green. <laughs> tell you, boogers are a blessing because they remind us we don't see ourselves no matter how cool we think we looking. Somebody else sees it. Now how many of y'all got upset when the person said, hey, you got a friend there? Did you say, you don't know me. You can't see me. My heart's right. I'm a good person. <laughs> what you gonna do? You got a napkin? Let me get this napkin and get that cleaned up. Everybody understand? Let's go look at one more scripture. Let's go to the, the, to the second chapter of the book of Luke. The second chapter of the book of Luke, and we're going to start reading at verse 41. says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But everybody see that? The child Jesus. Everybody see that? But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, Now you have to keep in mind, why, were they, why was this such a panic for them? Because you keep in mind, they fled to Egypt to, to keep his life. When Herod had went for his life when he was little, they fled into Egypt. And then after Herod died, they brought him back. And so they still knowing this is a special young man. He's the son of God. And they know the devil ain't going to stop trying to kill him. So in them, they're panicking. And that's why Mary asked, why did you do this? Why did you deal with us this way? Verse 49, and he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not, in other words, know ye not, that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Now let's read verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Everybody see that? Who was Jesus Christ? He was God. The Bible says that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. But let's read now. How many of us read that scripture before? We know about that scripture. All right, but do we know about this one? Let's read verse 51. And see why he increased. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Everybody see that? That's why he increased in wisdom. Because, listen, God, while he was in eternity, looked down and saw that Mary was worthy to give birth to him and that Joseph was a just man to raise him. He picked him out before he came and then he made himself flesh and was born to this couple and, and even took away the wisdom that he had in eternity. He could have been born with it. He could have just came down a grown man. And there he was sitting with lawyers, 
people that were educated and, be, and, and baffling their minds about the things he knew. And then when his parents came for him, he turned right around and submitted to them. Why? So that he could continue to grow in wisdom. He didn't say, well, y'all see me in here? I don't need nothing from y'all. I'm already, I, I, you don't see these educated folks in here just baffled at what I know? Yeah, they baffled, but you know what? I got some other stuff I'm going to learn. I'm going to go and I'm going to commit myself to y'all. Y'all got some other stuff to teach me. That was God. Now, how in the world do you think you're going to stand before God and get a pass? And you ain't been nothing but flesh. How do you think you're going to stand before God with all that pride and can't nobody tell you anything? When God himself wrapped himself in flesh and submitted to flesh. If God himself had to learn and grow in wisdom, what kind of pride do you have to have that you've already surpassed that? Does everybody understand? He came to be our example. He told us in his word in the same, in, in, in the book of Matthew, take my yoke and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. Everybody understand? I'm meek enough to be God, and I'm low enough, I'm lowly enough to learn from my own creation. In Moses' day, God wanted to, wanted to destroy all of Israel and start over with Moses. But you know what? God listened to Moses. Moses said, God, if you do that, then the people are going to say that you, you couldn't finish what you started. You brought them out of Egypt, but you couldn't. You didn't have enough strength to bring them into the promised land. So don't destroy them. And the Bible says God hearkened unto Moses. If God can hearken to flesh and blood, how do you think you're going to get into heaven? Too proud to hearken. That ain't going to happen. We're going to have to be humble. We're going to have to learn to accept somebody no more than me. Everybody understand? I'm telling you the nature of God. We're going to have to have that nature. Everybody understand? Now, let's think about it. The Bible says that he, he was subject unto them. Now, you know what that means? Listen, this was before he got the Holy Spirit. This was before the Holy Spirit descended upon him. He was subject unto, unto them. Let me ask you this question. How many girlfriends did the Lord have growing up? How many baby mamas did he have? How many parties was he going to getting drunk? How many drugs did, did, did God have to save him from? How many venereal diseases did he get before he caught on and decided I'm going to be celibate for the rest of my life? He had a mama and daddy there to guide him, and he listened and hearkened to what they said. You stay away from this one. Everybody understand? That wasn't just automatic for him. He was flesh and blood. The Bible says he was tempted in all manner like what we are. He wanted a girlfriend at one point. He had reproductive organs. He went through puberty. But he was subject to his parents. His mama was a virgin, <laughs> so she could, that's something that she could teach him. I don't know what the Lord's will is for you, Jesus, as far as you getting married, but I'm telling you, keep yourself. Okay, mama. Yes, ma'am. Everybody understand? 
No, God didn't come down and pour all of this wisdom on the inside of him. God gave himself parents. That's what you're going to get it from. Somebody that no more than you. Everybody see? The Lord hearkened to his own creation. Made them and then hearkened to them. Not, not because he needed to, but to be our example. Now let's think about that. He was God all the way. And that part of himself that he left in heaven, if he'd have said, well, you know what? I'm the son of God, and I can by bypass all of this human stuff. You just down, just uploaded me everything you want me to know. Then he himself would have rejected him in earth. Everybody understand? No, but that's, not, that's not what you programmed me to do, the part of me that you left up here. I'm not programmed to do that. You're going to have to get it the way everybody else is getting it. You're going to have to grow in wisdom. That conversation never happened. He came here humble and meek. He was born where animals were. And it's amazing to me, ain't nobody in here was born with a silver spoon in their mouth, but we still got pride like, we, like that was the case. What is the Lord trying to do? He's trying to keep us from experiencing things that we don't have to go through. Everybody understand? The Lord didn't have to get saved. He didn't have, he, everybody understand? The Lord didn't have a testimony. He just stayed on the right path the whole time. He didn't have to go out and sleep around before he found out folks in the world is just off the rocker. And everybody understand? You don't see him in the book of, of, of John saying, well, you know what? God saved me from them drugs. And what am I saying? He did not have to live a life of salvation. All he had to do was follow instruction. It wasn't about him being saved. It was about him just being subject to his parents who were God-fearing parents. Everybody understand? Let's get out of this whole thing. Some of us, we've been waiting all our life to be grown, only to find out just how big of fools we are. What does being grown mean? Nothing when you're outside of Christ. Nothing when you can't receive instruction. My prayer is that we'll give heed, take heed to what the Lord is saying. He avoided a lot of the things that teenagers went through, that young folks went through. He avoided all of that. They had venereal diseases back then. People had girlfriends, people were sleeping around, they were doing all of that, all this, the stuff we're doing now, they were doing it back then. Why was he able to live, live such a clean life? Think about it, he was the last Adam. He could have sinned just like the first one did. He could have. But he was subject. Everybody understand? Nobody gets beyond being subject. Does everybody understand? There he was in that temple, displaying the wisdom that he had gotten, acting in his calling, and then when his parents come from for him, yes, ma'am, I'm going to follow y'all right on back to our hometown. I'm, I'm going with y'all. What, you want me to wash the dishes? Yes, ma'am. I ain't, I ain't too grown to do what you're telling me to do. Everybody understand? And even around 30, when his mama wanted him to do something about them running out of wine, what did he do? He did it. You know why? He was still subject. I'm going to honor my parents. 
And even at his death, he was still looking out for his mother. John, behold your mother. Mama, behold your son. In other words, you take care of her. Still subject. Everybody understand. And then he took it a step fur fur further. When his mama came for him, the Bible don't say he just flat out rejected him, her and his, his siblings. He said, who are my mother and who are my brethren but those that do the will of my father? He wasn't saying that his mama had stopped being his mama. What he was saying was, I, re I submit, I'm subject to everybody that's old enough to be my mother. It ain't just about my biological mama. That's for those of us who the devil's sitting here planting our mama. My mama wasn't no good. She didn't, she not living for the Lord. The Lord was saying, I got a whole family of folks that I can be subject to. Who are my mother? Everybody understand? I got, I'm going to stay that way. As long as somebody can teach me something, I'm wanting to learn. That's the way we have to be if we're going to be in Christ. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this word that we've heard. Lord, we pray that you will allow it to help us, Lord, in our walk with you. Help us, Lord, to be humble enough to receive what you had to say. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us clearly. Help us to see the things in it, Lord, that you were saying. Help us to apply it to our lives, Lord, so that we can continue to grow in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. So today we're going to do a baptism. So, but John, you want to go ahead and start letting some of that water you want to get in your club? All right. So um, the Lord says the same. We're going to baptized brother and sister Thomas and uh, we're going to uh, finish the work on them that the Lord started and uh, we'll go from there so if that's all now we'll go ahead and be dismissed from this service and and uh, we'll we got to drain some of that water out of that pool so we can <laughs> baptize them the way we normally do so if that's all now we're dismissed in the name of Jesus Christ